Someone, someone give me a praise for Jesus right now. Come on now. Praise oh, Jesus. Amen. 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 Give me enough. You woke me up this morning. That's a good thing. That's tough to do out right here. Amen. <laughs> Any more praises? That's it? We all hibernating today? Trust me. Oh, that's an excellent prayer. <laughs> You're a Christian, you ain't got to praise for Jesus. You're either asleep or hibernating or dead, one of the others. Give me a praise for Jesus, somebody. Pray to be alive. Amen. There's a good one. Another one? Pray to be alive. Amen. Amen. I woke up today. Amen. I'm going to talk. I'm praising Amen. Amen. Still have a job. Amen. Any more? I did that this morning is because y'all uh, y'all need a little inspiration to understand why you're serving Jesus today. Because I'm here to tell you that I know it's a little chilly out and I know it's a little chilly in here but it should be hot with the Holy Spirit. So we all have reasons to praise Jesus. We all have reasons to worship Him and we all need to give it our best every time we come to worship Him. Amen. Try that again. Are you ready? Welcome to Shine Line Baptist Church. I'm glad you're here. What a wonderful celebration we had last week for our anniversary. See, it's working. It's like popcorn. You just got to heat it up to get them to pop. Yeah. And one salvation, four families joined the church, if you will, last week. You know what that shows me? That shows me this church is alive and the Holy Spirit is bringing people in and people want to be part of this. They want to be part of serving God. And that's a great thing. Amen? Amen. All right. Today, we get back to the, well, I guess before we get started, forgive me, I have a gaping hole in my jaw that pulled a tooth Friday, so if I'm a little hard to hear, uh, I apologize, but... Let me know. I'll come back there and preach right at you. <laughs> there you go. Just, I just lost one, too. Today we get back to our churches in Revelation. Today is the Church of Philadelphia. To catch us up, let's look. So far we have seen the loss of the first love, the true motivation why we serve. We have seen a warning of persecution. We have seen a warning of compromise, we have seen a warning of tolerance, and we have seen the warning of a spiritually dead church. Today, we talk about Philadelphia. A little bit about, about the background of Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a successful commercial center because it sat on the entrance of a particularly fertile valley, also known for its many temples and religious festivals. It was a mecca back in its time. It was destroyed by earthquake in 17 AD and then later rebuilt. Jesus' praise for Philadelphia was that although not having a loud voice in the community, it remains faithful and true to Christ. And we can sort of identify with the church in Philadelphia today, can't we? Since the 60s uh, and on, the church have allowed their voice to go weaker and weaker. Not so loud in the community today, is it? The voice of Christians is not a concern to society that doesn't care if they offend us. The voice of weaker Christians doesn't concern them about our opinions and our beliefs. We're not protected by the laws as well as other religions. And that's because our voice is getting weak. And part of that is the reason is because the churches are bending to society. And we will look at that as we go through. But even though the, the church of Philadelphia's voice was getting weak, they were still being praised for their faithfulness and truth to Christ. Look at verses 7. We'll start with verse 7. Right to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and closes and no one opens. 
says. We'll stop there for just a minute. Jesus is reminding them that he is holy from his birth to his death. He is the Holy One. Hebrews 7.26 says, For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Jesus is also the truth, which means he's genuine. John 14.6 says, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he's also reminding them that he is the key of David. Luke 1, 20, or 1, 32 and 33 says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. 33. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. If we go back to the Old Testament, to the prophet Isaiah, you'll see in Isaiah 22, 22, I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulders. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. Let's talk about that phrase for just a minute, because that phrase insinuates great power. Power that cannot be matched or rivaled with any known abilities. It speaks of Christ's authority in the household of God. It is a picture of the control the steward has over the dis distribution of resources of the master's house. Resources of the power of the Holy Spirit. Resources of the blessings that he wants to give us. <coughs> of the wisdom that he wants to depart to us. And of the salvation that our Lord Jesus provides. No one can close the door that Jesus opens. And no one can open the door that Jesus closes. Talking about the one who has always been holy. The one that is genuine. The one that has the power over the world. This is what he says to the church of Philadelphia. Look at verse 8. I know your works, there we go again, because you have limited strength, have kept my words, and have not denied my name. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one is able to close. Amen. <coughs> Jesus is talking about them having limited power, limited strength. And he's already talked about their voice being weak in society. The Greek word here is interesting. It's used as dynamite, which we get the English word dynamite. A little package and a big boom. Even though that their voice is weak, the church of Philadelphia who stands true for Jesus, the one that has all the power, has all the blessings, and has all the abilities, is backing can make a big boom. You know what that tells us? That tells us that the lack of numbers is not a reason not to serve. It tells us that when we choose to serve, we should make that decision on God's leading us, not what the numbers tell us. It says the Holy One, the genuine One, the One with all the power that is backing us, that stands for His Word. We have that blessings, we have that power, we have that strength to serve Him. And that's key. There's no excuses not to serve. There's no excuses not to do what God tells us to do. If we look at it from God's logic instead of human logic, I was part of a church one time and God was leading us to do something and I would go to the leadership and I'd say, this is what God's telling us we need to do. Y'all need to pray about it. And the first thing that didn't come out of their mouth is what's in the budget? What's the finances look like? And at that moment, not in that time, I knew they were not interested in following what God wanted, but just in the human numbers. Let me say this, you can't walk out on faith if you think that you can do it on your own power. It's impossible. 
It's impossible to serve God by faith if you think you can do it by yourself. We need a leadership and we need a church that says, you know what? You're right. Let's go to prayer. Let's see where we're going. Let's get a united vote on this through God the Holy Spirit, a comfort that He's leading us. And to heck with all the numbers. Let's go out and do what God wants us to do. That's a church that has the power. A great example is Peter right after the crucifixion at the end of John and starting in the beginning of Acts. They bolt themselves up into the upper room there. And Peter says, go count how many followers there still are. And remember, this is the crowd that were screaming and cheering as they crucified their Savior. And Peter says, go find out how many numbers is left. And then the Holy Spirit was introduced to them through Jesus. And they gained the power of the Holy Spirit, the blessings of the Lord, the genuine Jesus. Who opens a door that no one can close and closes a door that no one can open. And you will see in the beginning of Acts, as we delve into Acts coming up here pretty soon, how they set records and people coming to Jesus with those little bit of numbers that Peter was worried about in the beginning. If we worry about the human numbers instead of serving God, we will never see God's blessings upon us. We must serve God. And this is how Philadelphia's voice is getting lower and lower and lower. Because they were not choosing to step out on faith as they should. They're not choosing to do the things that God's telling them to do. And they're, they're actually putting themselves and God in a box of human power. Can you imagine a church running on human power? I can't. I can't imagine the church running on human power. Well, I can. They're dead churches. You'll see them all the time. Little numbers is not a reason or an excuse not to serve God when we need to serve Him with a loud voice. <clears throat> Jesus praises them for keeping their, His words, not denying His name. Churches and seminaries today are denying Jesus' name. Seminaries are denying Jesus' name by not teaching the virgin birth. Liberal seminaries are denying Jesus' name, not talking about the resurrection. Liberal seminaries today are denying Jesus' name and his power by denying this literal six-day creation. I've told the story a dozen times, so I won't go into it too much, but... In one of my exams, the professor said that uh, the answer to the question in Genesis 1 was the gap theory. And the gap theory is that space of time between verse 1 and verse 2 so they could fit all the scientific stuff into it so that they can conform with the world. I don't believe in that. I believe in the literal six-day creation because I believe my God can do anything he wants. He has the power to speak us into existence. So he said, well, mark it the gap theory, because you know the answer, and then when you get out there, you can preach anything you want. I said, no, I will not do that. I marked it what I thought was right. I got it wrong, but I passed the test. Because we're either willing to stand for Jesus the whole time, or we're not willing to stand for Jesus at all. He didn't ask us to be his children part of the time. He asked us to be his children all the time. He didn't ask us to follow him part of the time. He asked us to follow him all the time. He didn't ask us to serve him part of the time. He asks us to serve him all the time. And then Jesus tells him that he is the key of David. All right, going on to verse 9. Take note, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan. Now that's the second time in two different churches that he has called the Jewish people the synagogue of Satan. <clears throat> I will make them from the synagogue of Satan who claims to be Jews and are not. That's Revelation chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. 
but are lying. Note this, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. As we read through these churches, we can see that Satan has infiltrated several of these churches. And the same can be said for today. Satan has infiltrated a lot of our churches today. They are bowing their knees to those that tickle their ears. How does Satan get in? He get in through the cracks. What's the cracks? Well, I'm going to tell you the cracks so we don't have them. A church needs to have a very strong and powerful prayer life. A church needs to have a very strong and powerful studying life in their, in their life. Studying scripture, knowing scripture. And a church needs to have a very powerful fellowship in their life. Because fellowship is just as important as the other two because that's where we get our strength from one another. When we care about somebody, we're willing to go the extra mile than we are if we don't care about somebody. I know there's churches in this town that they have a lot of members, probably the same amount we do, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. But I also know when they walk out on the streets on Monday, they don't recognize the people they sit with Sunday. Or they can't tell you their names. Because they choose not to have a relationship. They just choose to set up on a Sunday. Church should have a relationship. Church should care. You need a church that is willing for someone to go over to somebody in need and give them a break when they're set with loved ones. You need a church that's willing to call or text you and hold you accountable or to tell you that I'm praying for you. You need a church that cares enough that in the prayer life that they'll pray with them over the phone and pray for them and let them know. But see, a lot of churches don't have a strong prayer life. They don't have a strong reading of the word. And they don't have a strong fellowship. And then Satan infiltrates through those crowds. How does he do that? This is what we're talking about. Paul says in Romans 9, 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not one who are descended from Israel are Israel. <clears throat> so what Paul's saying is that God's word is not effective. God's word is not all powerful. What Paul is saying that there are people in the churches that do not follow God. They have a different master. They have a different agenda. And do you know how you fork those folks? Do you know how to ferret those folks out? You got to have a strong prayer life. You got to have a strong understanding of God's word, and you got to have a strong fellowship. If you do those three things, those folks that are trying to infiltrate with their own agenda will stick out like sore thumbs and they should be treated as sore thumbs. <clears throat> Jesus says that he will make those enemies that are infiltrating the church of Philadelphia know that he loves those that follow him. Romans 14, 11, that's not on here. It's an extra verse. I won't charge you for it. Romans 14, 11 says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Lord. He's going to do the same. He's going to do the same when he comes back after the great tribulation, when he finally puts an end to it all and revelation is finally fulfilled and, and sealed. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess and they're going to know the one true Lord. Amen. Look at verses 10 and 11. Because you have kept my commands to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come over the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The hour of testing, I believe, is talking about is the great tribulation that is coming. And if that's the truth, then it will also say to you that it's another sign of the rapture. Because Jesus is telling them to hold on, telling the faithful to hold on, because he and wait for his coming quickly. So no one can steal your crown. Look at verse 12. The victor, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. 
the faithful inherits the promise given to them. The promise that comes from the one who opens the door and no one can close. The one who closes the door and no one can open. Hebrews 6.12 says, So that we won't become lazy, but will be in imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. The key word in that verse is lazy. See, Christians are supposed to have a hunger. They're supposed to always be hungry for God's Word. They're supposed to be always hungry for prayer. And they're supposed to be always hungry for fellowship. Ministries is the result of that hunger. Lazy means contentment. And let me tell you, contentment kills churches. Contentment turns churches into social clubs. Contentment turns churches into just another visit in social society. We should never be content when it comes to serving our God. We should always strive to be over and above. This year, God gave us the vision of what we're doing here in 2016, 17 year. It's a lot. It's a lot that we weren't able or willing to do in years past. To put time in and fix the building, to grow Sunday schools, to grow persons, to go out and ministry, to build these walls, to fix that room, all these things. We can't do that if we're content. I'm not content in just seeing all your lovely faces today. I want to see more. I'm not content in just telling one person about Jesus Christ. I want to tell them more. I'm not content in just worshiping on Sunday. I want to do it all the time. I'm not content at all, ever, on learning about scriptures. We can't be content. We need to hold on. We need not to give up. But above all, we must press toward the mark until God calls us home and we go to see Him. Or He comes and gets us. We must press toward the mark. We must have a hunger in our lives to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. There's got to be a hunger and a fire in our souls and the pits of our stomachs for God's Word and for prayer. There has to be a hunger in our lives for fellowship to get to know one another. And if we do that, our voice will grow. If we're a ready God, we'll use us for every opportunity that he has. So here's the question for the week. How can we maintain the standard to be the light to a lost world? How can we maintain the standard to be the light to a lost world. Well, we do it with a strong prayer. Line. We do it with a strong understanding of God's word. And we do it with a strong hunger for fellowship. That's how we do it. We have to hold on to what we have, which is our first love. And the faithfulness of the church that is described in verse 8. And I'm going to leave you with this verse. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 3 5 says, May the Lord direct your hearts to God's love and Christ's endurance. Endurance is key. <clears throat> The only reason you need endurance is if you're pressing toward the mark. That's what he's saying. You need endurance because I don't expect you to stop serving God. I don't expect you to stop making your prayer life stronger. I don't expect you to stop ministering to all the world. I don't expect you to stop 
teaching and studying the Word, and I don't expect you to stop in fellowship with me and my brothers and sisters in Christ. Bow your heads with me if you will. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can change that. If you're listening to us by CD or watching us by video, all you need to do is say this prayer. You don't have to say it out loud, but you do have to mean it. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm lost and I need you in my life. Replace my will with yours and I will follow you for eternity. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With every head still bowed and every eye still closed. If you said that prayer today by our, our CD or our video ministries, welcome to the family of God. I encourage you to come here to Cheyenne Baptist Church, 294 Mount Vernon Avenue, Marion, Ohio, 43302, and tell us about that decision that you made today so that we can celebrate with you and help you grow as a Christian. Maybe you have a local fellowship. Maybe your family has a church that you're comfortable with. And I encourage you to go to that pastor and tell them about the decision that you made today so that they can help you along your, your walk as a believer. If you're here today and you said that prayer, with every head still bowed and every eye still closed, just raise your head and look up at me and I ask you three questions. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, but maybe you're not on fire like you should be. Maybe you slipped into neutral, into contentment. Maybe your prayer life isn't as strong as where it needs to be. Maybe you're not studying God's Word enough to have a good and working knowledge of Scripture. Or maybe you just not fellowshipping enough with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you today, I encourage you to follow what He tells you to do. We have counselors and prayer warriors standing by to pray with you. This altar is open for kingdom business. Alright, you may raise your heads and stand with us. Thank you.